1852, a remarkable manuscript was discovered by a Capuchin monk in the highlands of Ethiopia. The text told of a man named Zara Jacob, born, in the land of the priests of Aksum, educated by traditional Ethiopian scholars and driven from his home by the conflict that broke out between the two groups. Zara Jacob was an Ethiopian philosopher from the city of Aksum in the 17th century. His 1667 treatise, developed around 1630 and known in the original Guizhi language as the Hat Atta, inquiry, has been compared to René Descartes' Discours de la Method. For centuries, Guizhi texts had been written in Ethiopia. Jacob was born into a farmer family near Aksum in northern Ethiopia, the former capital of Ethiopia under the ancient kingdom of Aksum. Jacob's name means the seed of Jacob, Zer, is the Guizhi word for seed. Although his father was poor, he supported Jacob's attendance of traditional schools, where he became acquainted with the Psalms of David and educated in the Ethiopian Orthodox Christian faith. He was denounced before Emperor Susenios, who had turned to the Roman Catholic faith and ordered his subjects to follow his own example. Refusing to adopt the Catholic faith, Jacob fled into exile with some gold and the Book of Psalms. On the road to Shua in the south, he found a cave at the foot of the Tikis River and lived in it as a hermit for two years, praying and developing his philosophy. He wrote of his experience, I have learnt more while living alone in a cave than when I was living with scholars. What I wrote in this book is very little, but in my cave I have meditated on many other such things. After the death of the emperor, Susenios's son Phasilides, a firm adherent of the Ethiopian Oriental Orthodox Church, took power, expelling the Jesuits, and extirpated the Catholic faith in his kingdom in 1633. Jacob left his cave and settled in Emphraz. He found a patron, a rich merchant named Habta Exiaber, known as Habtu, and married a maid of the family. Jacob became the teacher of Habta's two sons, and at the request of his patron son Valda Haywat, Jacob wrote his famous 1667 treatise investigating the light of reason. It is believed that he lived a fulfilled family life in Emphraz and remained there for the next 25 years. He died there in 1692. Jacob's year of death was recorded by Valda Haywat in an annotation to the treatise. Zara Jacob's inquiry goes further than these former texts, as he argues in following one's natural reasoning instead of believing what one is told by others. He was a contemporary of the female activist Walada Petros, whose biography was written in 1672. In the cave the exile produced a philosophical system of exceptional depth and originality, grounded in an account of a universal faculty of libuna, reason, understanding, or intelligence, which allowed every human being to reflect on the world and its creator, and to literally see the difference between truth and falsity, good and evil. This faculty was divinely endowed, a product of a preordained harmony between creator and creation, the creator put in the heart of humans the light of intelligence, that they may see good and evil, recognize what is and is not their duty, and distinguish the truth from a lie. The philosopher constructed arguments for the existence of God, elaborated a theodicy, and harshly critiqued what he saw as the corruptions of organized religion, of orthodoxy, Catholicism, Islam, and Judaism alike. In his later years, having descended from the cave to live a simple life in the town of Infraz, the philosopher gained a disciple, Valda Haywat, who encouraged him to write down his ideas, and who would develop his thought into a system of social ethics in a companion treatise, the Hatata Valda Haywat, at the same time that Zara Jacob was meditating in his cave. Another more familiar 17th-century philosopher, René Descartes, conducted his own set of solitary meditations on God, reason, and the basis of knowledge. The contemporary emergence of these set of reflections in France and Ethiopia have struck many commentators. 
in the words of one historian serves to demonstrate that modern philosophy, in the sense of a personal rationalistic critical investigation, began in Ethiopia with Zara Jacob at the same time as in England and in France. Why then, have so few of us heard the name of Zara Jacob? The answer lies in the 19th century discovery of the manuscript, and the subsequent reception history of the text. The Capuchin monk who discovered the manuscript, Giusto d'Urbino, was tasked with collecting rare and unusual manuscripts by Antoine d'Abadie, an Irish Basque explorer, geographer, and the head of the Academy de Sciences in Paris. After the death of Abadie, the works were donated to the Bibliothèque Nationale. In the first years of the 20th century, scholars who examined this unprecedented collection were struck by this unique work. In just a few years two critical editions from Boris Turiev, 1905, and Enno Littmann, 1909, were published and translated into Latin and Russian respectively. Becoming the object of significant attention in scholarly circles, Turiev and Littmann themselves took the work seriously as a work of philosophy, appending short expositions of their own, and while both saw outside influences in the work, Littmann discerning the influence of early Islamic Kalam on Zara Jacob's cosmological argument, and Turiev intriguingly suggesting an analogy with the English deist Herbert of Sherberry, both considered the Hatata to be a fundamentally Ethiopian text. Jacob is most noted for this ethical philosophy surrounding the principle of harmony. He proposed that an action's morality is decided by whether it advances or degrades overall harmony in the world. While he did believe in a deity, whom he referred to as God, he rejected any set of particular religious beliefs. Rather than deriving beliefs from any organized religion, Jacob sought the truth in observing the natural world. In Hatata, Jacob applied the idea of a first cause to produce a proof for the existence of God, thus proposing a cosmological argument in Chapter 3 of Hatata. If I say that my father and my mother created me, then I must search for the creator of my parents and of the parents of my parents until they arrive at the first who were not created as we are, but who came into this world in some other way without being generated. However, the knowability of God does not depend on human intellect, but our soul has the power of having the concept of God and of seeing Him mentally. God did not give this power purposelessly, as He gave the power, so did He give the reality. He argued too against discrimination, predating John Locke by decades, in chapter 6 of Hatata, starting the chapter with, All men are equal in the presence of God, and all are intelligent since they are his creatures. He did not assign one people for life, another for death, one for mercy, another for judgment. Our reason teaches us that this sort of discrimination cannot exist. In chapter 5 of Hatata, he criticizes slavery saying, the Mohammedans said that it is right to go and buy a man as if he were an animal. But with our intelligence, we understand that this Mohammedan law cannot come from the Creator of man who made us equal, like brothers, so that we call our Creator our Father. At the time, slavery was widely practiced in Ethiopia, but just as the Hatata was gaining broader interest, in 1920 an article appeared in the journal Asiatique by the Italian Orientalist Carlo Conti Rossini, arguing that the work was a forgery, whose author was none other than its the supposed discoverer, Giusto d'Urbino. Conti Rossini's argument was full of philological rigor, but also cultural speculation. The authorship of the Hatata was challenged by Carlo Conti Rossini in 1920, who claimed it was forged by Father Giusto d'Urbino, an Italian scholar who worked in Ethiopia. The arguments are extrinsic, based on the manuscript's recent age, his knowledge of Ethiopic language and culture, the information on Islam also being known by Dir Bino, and the fact that he discovered the two extant manuscripts. In 1934, Eugen Mitwatch put forward linguistic arguments for the inauthentic nature of the Hatata, and scholarly interest in the work waned. 
Amsalu Aklalu and Otto Alameyahu Moggs argued for the authenticity of the work, based on its non-religious contents, sentence structure, and the particularity of the guizi used. Claude Sumner wrote in favor of the inquiry's authenticity in 1976 with statistical evidence showing the duality of authors in their differing biblical quotations, using five newly found letters of Dear Bino in Rome. Sumner also argued that his knowledge of Guizi was worse than originally presented, and that he did not share the ideas of the Hat Atta at the time he was supposed to have written it, ideas as those of Zara Jacob would not be expected in Ethiopia, where faith and Byzantinism of the interpretations of the Holy Scriptures seem to oppose an insuperable barrier to free thinking, whose blossoming over there we would not even know, as it were, how to imagine, while Turiev and Littmann tried to account for this singularity by identifying external influences. Conti Rossini claimed that the text could only come from outside the Ethiopian tradition entirely, from the influence of a more civilized agency. Real philosophy, he suggested, was impossible in Ethiopia. This explained how the text appears to anticipate Enlightenment ideas or to mirror Descartes, the true author of the text had read them in 19th century Europe. Eventually scholars in the burgeoning field of Ethiopian studies became convinced that the work was a forgery. A new consensus was established and the Hatata fell into obscurity, the answer, then, to why you have not heard of Zara Jacob is that he did not exist. The Hatata is not the first work of African philosophy, not the jewel of Ethiopian literature, but an intricate and elaborate forgery, by a lonely monk in a foreign land, or is it? Conti Rossini was not only the preeminent scholarly authority of East Africa, but between 1899 and 1903, also a colonial administrator in Italian Eritrea. In the early 30s he published, an article arguing that Ethiopia was incapable of civilizational progress, and that it therefore could, indeed should, be colonized by a civilizing power. It formed part of a coordinated program of fascist imperial propaganda in the sciences and humanities, and in 1937, midway between the Italian conquest of Ethiopia and the beginning of World War II, Conti Rossini received the Mussolini Award from the Accademia Nazionale del Sienz, for his services to history and moral sciences. The cultural politics of the debate would be reversed half a century later when, during the period of the decolonial reassertion of an indigenous African intellectual heritage, a number of scholars took up the question of authorship once again. The Ethiopian scholars Amsalu Alkalu and Almayahu Moggs pioneered arguments grounded in a deep knowledge of Ethiopian educational traditions. Suggesting that the forms of biblical quotation demonstrate that the author was educated in traditional Orthodox schools. Claude Sumner, in his monumental five-volume Ethiopian Philosophy, 1974-8, offered rigorous statistical analyses of sentence and paragraph length and comparative philology between the Hatata and Dear Bino's other works, claiming to demonstrate that the work could not possibly have been forged by Dear Bino. The authorship debate today still rages. Opinions are polarized. Among recent publications, the late, eminent scholar Gedichu highly argued for the Hatata's authenticity, while a seminal series of articles by Anais Wyan argued the case for forgery. Ongoing work, including a new translation by Ralph Lee, Wendy Belcher and Mihari Werku and an edited volume from Jonathan Ejid, Fazil Maroy and Leah Cantor will provide yet new perspectives on the Hatata. Whoever the author, the Hatata is a most remarkable document, a profound work of philosophy an anguished reflection on political and religious strife and a compelling narrative of a life in thought. If its author was indeed a 17th century Ethiopian, our understanding of the development of modern philosophy will be changed in radical ways. If its author is a 19th century Italian monk, it is one of the most remarkable literary forgeries ever created. 
By now scholarship on the Hatata has expanded far beyond the authorship debate to include examinations of the philosophy, style and subsequent impact of the text, regardless of the author, and the broader cultural significance of the work. A forthcoming conference at Worcester College, Oxford, organized in collaboration with Philemonality will examine the ideas. Language and history of the Hatata Zare Yaqab by bringing together scholars from across the world and across disciplinary boundaries. It aims to stimulate a productive dialogue between scholars from philosophy, history, philology, and Ethiopian studies, and to serve as a prolegomenon to broader philosophical study of the Hatata, bringing these remarkable works and the world they describe to the widest possible audience.